Hello everyone and welcome to our Choosing Books for the Classroom. This time we're going to be talking about children's poetry and we've got lots of fabulous panellists joining us uh, for this session and some great poetry books to share with you. Of course the very first thing that we should do is share a poem. I mean it would be very strange to have a Choosing Poetry webinar and not start with a poem. The poem I've chosen to begin with is by Deborah Bertoulis, and it's from her collection, Where Do Wishes Go?, published by Otterberry Books. Poems are doors. Poems are doors there to unlock. You already have the key. Sit down with one in a cosy nook. Then you'll see what I mean. Be prepared for magic, ready for a thunderous ride, riding a silver-maned unicorn with moonlight as your guide. Dance in the forest with fairies, swim in the ocean with whales, fly to the stars or walk on the moon, follow the mystery trail. Poetry transports you over land and air and sea. Find your poetry door today, you already have the key. And here we are, everybody uh, who is joining me today. We have uh, Helen Morgan, uh, who you probably saw last time. Hi, Helen. Uh, Roy Moss. Erin Hamilton. Joe Bowers. Sam Keeley. And Kate Hitchings. Now, they're going to be sharing some of their favourite poetry books with you. But before we do that, um, I just wanted to reflect a bit on a recent survey that was conducted by CLPE and Macmillan, the first major survey into poetry in school since 2007. And they found uh, that access to poetry, I'm not talking exclusively about the teaching of poetry, but access to poetry was still limited in many schools. In fact, poetry being read aloud was less than once a week in 93% of schools. And in 20% of schools, children never had the opportunity to hear a poem read aloud. Nearly a quarter of schools reported that they taught poetry just once a year when there was a poetry um, module or sequence of work. And still very limited knowledge of poets as well. We know that the Teachers as Readers work that has been done by UKLA and the Open University initially found that teachers had a, a fairly limited range of poets that they knew and those tended to be the poets that they knew themselves from when they were children. The current picture shows that while that has expanded a little bit, so for example Joseph Coelho who is our current Children's Laureate uh, is now mentioned. It's still very limited knowledge of current children's poets, even though poetry publishing is actually booming and there's a lot to celebrate. So maybe I could just start by asking our panellists whether they are, being poetry enthusiasts and advocates in school, whether they're actually surprised by those findings. Helen, what about you? Um, I, I'm not surprised, actually, um, because I think one of the first things that you do as a teacher is just go to those the poetry books and the poet, poems that you used to read as a child. Um, so I think that's I think that's happening quite a lot, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised at all. Um, I know, first of all, if you think, what, what can I do to inspire children or I'll choose something that I used to love, which would be your first step, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important to do that, to share what we loved and love ourselves. Uh, that's part of the picture, isn't it? Sam, are you surprised by the once a year experience of poetry? And does it have to be like that? No, I think you drip feed poetry in all the time. But um, I think you sort of assume that everyone else will do what you do as a teacher. Um, and that definitely isn't the case. So it's sort of, it's it's sad, really, when children 
don't have that access because when you do introduce children to poetry they love it they really do I mean my class just adore poems and they find poems they love and then they love to write them in their own books and and just share them and read them and because they're so short you can have such short snippets you can just drop them in through the day it doesn't take a lot of time but um, but a lot of people are either scared of poetry or and just don't know the range that's out there. So they do tend to, like Helen said, rely, you know, fall back on old favourites and, yeah, not rather than have a mix and introduce new things. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that you want to change, really, as much as possible and introduce people to as many amazing poems as, you know, as you can. But it's sort of a slow, slow process. Mm, that's a good starting uh, point for us, really, because that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, that poem that we started the session with um, is from Deborah Bertoulis's Where Do Wishes Go, published by Otterbury Books. Otterbury Books being one of the publishers that are doing fantastic things with children's poetry. Um, and I just wanted to say that that's a really lovely collection for lower key stage two. Obviously, poetry isn't that restricted in terms of age but you know it would be placed really well there um, there are poems in that collection about poetry itself there's a fantastic one called poetry potty and it is about a school that's incredibly enthusiastic about poetry and it's obviously one that deborah has visited and been so impressed with that she's written a poet, poet poem about that school I mean, there are poems in there about eccentric people, but eccentric people who are looked up to rather than treated with, with suspicion. Uh, there's a woman who's really, Miss Jazz, who's fabulously colourful and eccentric and seems to captivate the young persona uh, of the poem, even though she unsettles uh, the mother. Um, and it's a real celebration of the imagination as well. Also, some very deeply emotional poems in that collection. This one is called Baby Sister. Trees in the churchyard stand in line, guarding this little sister of mine. My baby sister died inside my mummy's tummy. She will always be my sister and mum will always be her mummy. So... You know, the rhyme kind of softens it a little bit, but obviously that's the um, the saddest uh, of situations that you can imagine. And so in this collection of poem by, poems by Deborah, we have this full range um, of emotions, and that's what a great poetry collection can do. Well, we're going to come back to some of you later, uh, but first uh, we're going to hear from Sam and Helen. So a chance to talk to you both in a little more depth. Can't wait to hear more about your poetry choices. Uh, Helen, tell us what, what you've chosen to share. So um, I've chosen um, Cherry Moon um, by Zara Wheel. Um, as it's just, it's just a wonderful book. Um, it's, I've used this with um, so many children now, um, for both reading for pleasure and, and for teaching as well. Um, and I think what we love most about this book um, is it just immerses the reader in the wonders of nature. Um, and as Sam was just saying earlier, actually, some of the poems are so short. Um, and I think it's just great to show children that sometimes you can just have that, that snapshot, just see a, a, a perfect or a beautiful moment in nature. It doesn't have to be something really really long that's going to sort of frighten them um, and it's for that reason really that like, you can use this book from reception right through to year six um, it's wonderful and the um, illustration um, I'll show you one. <laughs> see um, the illustrations are just absolutely beautiful there's so much you can do with just the illustrations um, I think sometimes you don't need words there's, there's so much poetry just in in the in the picture um, there's so much that you can do with it. It's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, the, the children always say it just lets their imaginations run wild. It's one of the reasons they love it so much. I think one of the things that I love about her poetry, and there are several collections that she's written now, um, is that then they don't patronise the child in any way. She assumes that they're interested in, you know, deep subjects and that they want to see the world 
in a deep way, often with this strong natural theme that runs through. Is there a poem that you wanted to share with us? Yes, there is. <laughs> um, a really short one, but I just thought it was really powerful. Um, it's called Silence. Um, Silence waits inside and out, and like my poem takes its time, I have to be ready to hear it. Lovely. We almost need to just leave a bit of silence, and I've filled that silence now, which is a terrible thing to do. <laughs> uh, wonderful. So there's a connection, actually, between the poet that you've chosen and the poet that Sam's chosen, because they are both Clipper winners, the CLPE uh, Poetry Prize. And for any teacher looking for where they might start in terms of building their poetry collection, that's a really good starting place uh, because they, you know, have been selected by teachers and by poets and uh, Charlotte Hacking at CLPE as well. Sam, what? tell us more. Kate Wakeling, you haven't chosen... Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, it's the right place. Yeah, so it's not um, Moon Juice, which is possibly better known um, than this sort of the follow-up, Cloud Soup. Um, I actually prefer this, though, um, and I think it actually has what you talked about earlier, that full emotional range. Um, and she's got that real gift, which I think all good poets have, of just making the ordinary extraordinary yeah so things like she writes one about the little kind of um floating bits of dust um and and it just makes you see things in different ways the the poem about clouds um is a really clever one there's one about um kind of not being able to sleep and it's like a clock kind of a shape poem and but a really cleverly done one um so and she um i just i love the musicality of her poems and and she is a musician although she says she's a lapsed musician but obviously she's got that musicality in her soul which really comes across in the poems they're just they are beautiful to read aloud because the rhythm is so strong um, and she talks about words being sound objects um, and you know poem being word music and I think that's yeah really you know appropriate and there's that relatability in lots of the poems there's one I think it's one that you can read on different levels so there's one called um the day mum turned into a lion which I can relate to as a sometimes angry parent um and um and then and there are the sort of the poignant there's one um the grandma and the sea which is just um you know it really makes you sort of stop and um yeah really think that's a really thought-provoking poem so I just think it's a collection. I think when I initially re reviewed it, it was interesting. I would look back at the review I wrote and um, and I put in it about it being more suited to upper key stage two. And I was rereading the poem thinking, I don't actually know why I thought that because um, I, I think there are lots of poems here that I would share with my key stage one children. So um, again, a good poetry collection is it kind of any age, isn't it? It goes up to, you know, and I think that's, that's the beauty. I think as an adult, I love to just dip in and read a poem and you put it aside. And that's what I want to teach children is that, mm. yeah, and that there are poems for different moods and different days. And sometimes you want a fun poem. Sometimes you just want one that does make you stop and think. So it's just a, a really wonderful collection. What have you chosen for us? Well, you know, I've chosen, um, it's one called The Flibbit. Um, because I think it just shows that kind of the rhythm and musicality of, of um, Kate's writing. Um, I don't know if I'll do it justice. I will try. Um, here's the thing about the flibbit, as it's time someone explained. She's quick as light and light as air with mischief on the brain. When you're sitting somewhere solemn and it's crucial you don't sneeze, she's what tickles at your nostrils with her small and knobbly knees. Or if you've put your shoes on and are ready to step out, but find an itch between your toes. Well, reader, have no doubt. It's the flibbit. Yes, the flibbit. Minor mayhem is her mission. She's the overlord of awkward irritations, top magician. That tingle on your scalp you get when someone mentions knits. Mull no more, for in your hair a certain someone sits. It's the flibbit. Yes, the flibbit. Who is fiddling with your follicles. This flibbit loves the whipping up of just such little obstacles. She's the ninja of the niggle, the nano nag you can't ignore, but take note her naughty knack is only nuisance, nothing more. 
So if you find yourself in trouble for a fretful sort of fidget, remember just to answer, not my fault, it was the flibbit. Yeah, it's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? <laughs> just with, while we're talking about poets that may not yet be familiar to, you know, the majority of teachers, I also want to uh, recommend Simon Lamb's debut collection, A Passing On of Shells, published by uh, Scallywag Press. And I guess this one spoke to me, maybe because of my age, because it's called Hip Hop. It's illustrated by, you don't get that, do you? You will when I show you. It's illustrated by Chris Riddell. And there's the granny. She's going off for, she's going off for her hip, hip hop. <laughs> so, <laughs> granny couldn't dance or bust a move. She shuffled oh so slow until one day she did proclaim these hips have got to go. And so... She had some operations that made her feel nine, not 94. Now, just you wait for Friday night. She'll hip hop out the door. Ask me. I'm going hip hopping tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much, both, for your wonderful um, choices there. Uh, next up, we have uh, Roy Moss, um, who I am sure many people know as our regular a blogger on best books for school not best books for schools on the just imagine <laughs> website let's get that right um roy you might have a blog coming up i know you won't want to say too much about it it's early days but i think you've got a blog coming up on poetry yes yes I have it's going to be exploring illustrations and that kind of thing to do with poetry and yeah I still need to give it some thought but yeah that's the, along the lines I'm looking forward to doing this one it's gonna be fun yeah. looking forward to reading it and <laughs> excellent we also had one recently didn't we poetry by heart and maybe that's worth mentioning uh to any teachers that might be listening yeah it's uh um an organization that's promoting um reading poetry out loud, uh, out loud by heart, um, learning poetry um, to boost confidence, essentially, I think, and to sort of, you know, get loads more out of the children. Um, you know, though there's a competition to go to um, London and perform them on stage. And I think it's a really good way of, um, you know, it's, it's all to do with like mental health as well. And, um, that kind of well-being and I think it's really really important and the website is great because it's got loads of really excellent poems um, across different age ranges where you can um, uh, just learn them yeah it's, yeah. it's, it's brilliant and I think people can find that easy easily enough if they search for poetry by heart they're going to be able to find that Definitely. but um, what have you chosen for us Roy? Well uh, the first book I chose is um, Tomorrow is Beautiful by Sarah Crossan. Well, it's edited by Sarah Crossan. She's chosen um, the poems in this anthology. Um, and um, Sarah Crossan is an author of many young adult uh, books in verse. Um, and I would say that this is geared to uh, that audience as well. However, there are plenty of poems that are suitable for um, sharing in primary schools as well. However, it's probably best in the hands of the teachers rather than the shelves of the library. Um, now the poems in here um, are described as um, they offer some light um, in the darkness. Um, and in Sarah's um, own words, they're um, word cures um, for when we need them the most, which I think is a really lovely way of putting it. Um, now Sarah's um, introduced the poems with a short annotation. Um, however, she says, um, and I really love this line. Um, you don't have to understand these poems. It's the poem's job to understand you, which I think is is really lovely. And um, it, it really do, they really do offer you some comfort. They they really do. And I know I know someone I'm going to lend this to um, at the weekend because I know they would get a lot of comfort from these poems at the moment. Um, and I think that's one thing great about poetry is that. So they're, they're a gift to other people as well. They're a, they're a brilliant gift to give um, because they, they mean so much. They're so personal. Um, 
anyway, Sarah really does understand her um, young adult audience. Um, I think that's clear about her novels as well. And when she's choosing other people's poems as well. Um, there's poems about heartbreak and they sit well besides ones about how we automatically think we failed at something. Um, there's a brilliant poem in here by a guy called Jack Gilbert, who I'd never heard of before. But he reminds us in a poem that everyone forgets that Icarus also flew, which I think is brilliant. So even though Icarus failed, but before that, he had a whale of a time flying, you know? How amazing is that? You know, I think that's- There that are worse ways to go. <laughs> exactly, and I think that line is gonna sit with me, you know, in my thoughts for, for, yeah. for, a, for a really long time. Um, other poets, you know, range from Shakespeare to Kay Tempest. Um, and Sarah has also some of her own uh, poems in here as well. Um, but I will end my thoughts on this book with a very short poem by a guy called Steve Sandfield. And it's, it's, it's very, very short and it's, the earth shakes just enough to remind us. Mm. And I think, yeah, it's something just, it's kind of a bit like a, um, you know, a mantra just to remind us that, you know, there's things going on in the world that, you know, reminds us <laughs> that there are lovely things in the world to uh, keep us going as well. Um, so yeah, that was the first one. Um, yeah. I'm going to share one with you just before you go on, um, yeah. Roy. An equally short poem. It's from, again, Where Do Wishes Go? The Deborah Bertou list that I um, mentioned at the beginning. And it's called Heart. There is a heart inside earth. Can you find it? That's it. I love the short poems. Poems. Sorry? I love it the took short me a while. It took yeah. me a while to work that one out and it shouldn't have done. But <laughs> in gonna... the heart inside earth, can you find it? Some perplexed places looking at me. You just have to think <laughs> about the spelling. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about your second book. Right, this one is for, um, definitely for primary. However, everyone will, will like this. Um, it's called... Um, marshmallow clouds um, and the subtitle is poems inspired by nature um, now this is by um uh, two very well established poets american poets um ted kuzer and connie wanek and it's illustrated by um uh english um guy called richard jones um who again is 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 very talented in art and graphics um now my favorite poems are nature poems by by far and so it would be remiss if I hadn't have, have picked something like this. Um, now, they're poems inspired by nature rather than nature poems as such. And I think that's a really subtle but interesting distinction to make. So where a nature poem might compare clouds to marshmallows, in this book, there's a poem about marshmallows that are sitting on a blue plate that makes the uh, speaker think of the sky. Um, which I think is a really subtle but interesting difference to talk about with the children, I think. I think it's it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, my favourite poem in here is called Boat, and this is one I was going to read out as well. Um, okay, so this is Boat. An aluminium boat has been left upside down on the blocks on the edge of the water. It looks like a hand cupped over a shadow to keep it from scuttling away. There's just enough air for the shadow to breathe and it's pulled in its head and it's bleached wooden oars and is waiting. It's been waiting all summer and maybe for thousands of years, peering out at the meddlesome world. Mm. I really like it. It's got, it's got all my favourite illustrations from the book in it as well and I will show it to you. And I think it has, I don't know if you can quite see it, but mm. right there is a pair of eyes. Wonderful. It's very reminiscent of John Classen's eyes and his in his work. That was that's what remind it reminded me of, and it's just it's just wonderful. It's very witty. Um, and fireplace is another poem of a great illustration, um, and it's um, described. A fireplace in this poem is described as a playpen um, for fire, which is described as an animal which is never full and never satisfied. Um, and it must never be let free. Um, and the images have a howling wolf in the flames. 
Um, and I think the illustrations are just as poetic as the poems themselves. And that's something else I will be exploring in my blog, actually. Um, so I'm, yeah, I am really, really looking forward to this. Um, now, I do love the picture book size and format. Um, it gives the illustrations so much space, um, which the illustrations are quite soft, quite minimal. Um, they don't distract from the words. They give them, there's lots of white space um, for the words and the words don't distract from the illustrations as well. So it's, it's a very much a, just a complete object really. And um, this could be used in any year group at primary, I think. I think mm. um, everyone will get something out of that. Definitely. Just before we go to our yeah. next uh, panelists, because you've brought up the poetry of image, I just want to mention an entirely different book, in definitely entirely different age uh, range, but uh, Jason Reynolds' Oxygen Mask, illustrated by Jason Griffin. Um, and I'm just very briefly going to mention that we have our Just Imagine summer school returning this summer and it's all about image and design um, and this is going to be one of the books that is included in that it's just three sentences of Jason Reynolds poetry but every page is also a visual poem and it's absolutely Ooh. stunning it's a poem for our time um, it starts, I'll, I'll just read the, the very beginning, breath one. And I'm sitting here wondering why my mother won't change the channel and why the news won't change the story and why the story won't change into something new. Instead of the every hour rerun about how we won't change the world. Or the way we treat the world. Or the way we treat each other. And my brother won't look up from his video game, even when I put my hand over the screen. Even when I put my hands on his, even when I turn my elbow into a fist and punch the bendy big knuckle into his ribs to try to knock his heart awake. And he just groans and ignores me. And don't even look up at the woman on the news saying another woman has just been. Entirely different to your book, Roy, but image and poetry no. complementing each other uh, to convey those powerful messages. Thank you so much. I'm going to move on to Erin uh, and Joe. Hi both, great to see you. Erin, since we last chatted, you've got a new job. Tell us about your new job. <laughs> I have a new job with Suffolk Libraries as the children's librarian. So looking at children's work across the county now, instead of just school-wide, looking county-wide. They are so lucky to have you and I can't wait Thank to you. see what happens in Suffolk. Keep us We've posted got, on all your plans. We've got big plans. <laughs> <laughs> um, big most plans. people will know that Joe Bowers is um, the Just Imagine Reviews editor and has done an amazing job so that, you know, we have the fantastic panellists here mm. who are reviewers plus many others. I don't know how many, Joe, but it's... it's oh, it's 60 two. plus. Yeah, 60 plus all bringing expertise to those reviews so that they can be really trusted and informative. So thank you, Joe, for that brilliant work that you do. But today I'm going to start with Joe because you mm. you kind of you, you kind of captured the nostalgia in me. Uh, you've chosen a book that I would have been reading a lot when I was a teacher. 
Mm. Well, that's kind of where I am, Nikki. I think same times that we were teaching in the classroom, I think. And um, I was looking, I was, I was, because I was um, curating everybody's lists together, I kept mine till the end to have a look and see what we hadn't done, if that makes sense, that we tried to capture. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to pop some classics in there because um, this is one of my favourite for Key Stage 2. Um, and I think for me, when I think of choosing poetry in the classroom, when I was a teacher in the classroom, it was always about collaborating. It was always about joining in and having fun and being playful. And I think Sam said something that resonated with me when she was talking earlier on. She said about dropping poems in through the day is key. And it was always about finding time for things that you loved. And I always thought poems were great because they weren't long and you could could actually do that with them. And it was always ones that they would want to learn and join in with. So I'm holding back, aren't I? I'm not saying what my book is. So my book is um, for Key Stage 2, Please, Mrs Butler. And I say Key Stage 2. It actually could be Key Stage 1. I've used it across the primary years, really. Um, I'm not sure there is a teacher in this land that hasn't heard of Please, Mrs Butler. So I'm not pretending to sort of give a new um, book that nobody's heard of before. But I probably wanted to say, don't forget it. Mm. If you haven't thought about it for a while, get it back out there. Um, for me, uh, the book just brings so many joyful memories. I'm sure they do for you too, Nikki, actually. One of which is that actually it's probably it's probably the book that is my most um, child-led, child-directed, child-scripted assembly that I ever um, did with I think it was key state at uh, year five um, class that I had and such was the love for this book in in the classroom that they said could we do this for our class assembly and I still to this day have huge happy memories it means to actually for children to actually want to do something more than just listen to the poem or say the poem and do something different because you've got to remember when they actually curated their own assembly they kind of rewrote the poems to suit the characters in their class. Because although when you read Please Mrs Butler, and it's about every aspect of life in school, isn't it really? You can sort of see different children in there. But equally, there are other children who may not be able to see themselves. So they kind of curated. So when we, we brought in... Um, Heard it in the playground, which is the other sort of book that partners up with it that came after it. And there's one where, where they do the register and they all answer the register in their own personality and who they liked to be and who they thought they behaved like in class. It was such a fun thing to do. I, I won't uh, say. Um, it was one of those books that always we found a reason to say the poems and I have to I'll, I'll just say that one of our favorite poems um, through many classes that I taught in was making a song out of the scissors poem and if you don't know the scissors poem I'll just read it to you are you not going to sing it <laughs> what I did think actually because actually I did sing it earlier on with my daughter and we all we remembered it my daughter remembered it as well and I I don't have the confidence I'm going to just say that now <laughs> but we used to sing it when we were clearing up and they would just be hopping and bopping around the classroom to this song basically and so if you don't don't know scissors I'll just quickly read it if you do I hope it'll just be a joyful memory really so scissors nobody leave the room everyone listen to me we had 10 pairs of scissors at half past two, and now there's only three. Seven pairs of tizzers, scissors have disappeared from sight. Not one of you leaves this room till we find them. We can stop here all night. Scissors don't lose themselves, melt away or explode. Scissors have not got legs of their own to go running up the road. We really need those scissors. That's what makes me mad. If it was seven pairs of children we'd lost, it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> I don't want to hear excuses, don't want anyone to speak, just ransack this room till we find them or we'll stop here all week. And it was just kind of one of those rhymes that took us right the way through at the end. And again, it reminded me of what Sam said earlier about finding a moment to drop those in. Um, so yeah, uh, for me, it's Please Mrs Butler. It was certainly one of the most requested rereads that I ever had when I was teaching, along with it has to be said, Roll Dahl's Revolting Rhymes. Both of those were constantly yeah. being requested. Um, and I think you can tell that Alan Olberg was a teacher 
there's a there's a kind of ring of authenticity about that do you feel that it's um aged well well look i was reading through it earlier and i was thinking I th like i when i remembered the um assembly that i did with the children and they did sort of adapt it and work it to suit the characters and the and, and the people they were in the classroom i think there's there are poems in there that you might want to sort of do just play around with yourselves as a class and do that but i think uh, f fundamentally i think it has actually um i don't know i'd like to hear from teachers who are teaching now because obviously i'm not in the classroom would you read that in the classroom do you think it still stands the test of time um i know for me it's just a delight and i still do think it has got possibilities really but what do you think nikki um some poems definitely so, you know, yeah. again, i'm just interested to hear from teachers who are still in the classroom i mean scissors is never going to go out of fashion never you know no. or glue sticks or whatever it is yeah. it's never going to change so yeah. yeah um and of course you can always be selective with poetry collections that's, Absolutely. The, that's the thing isn't it uh now to one of my great favourites, A.F. Harold, I think. Sorry, I was going to say my great favourites, Erin Hamilton, <laughs> not A.F. Harold, but they're both my favourites. So, Erin, <laughs> tell us what you've chosen. So, I've got A.F. Harold's The Book of Not Entirely Useful Advice. I've chosen it because I used it with a class um, several weeks ago now, and they just loved it. Just sort of the tongue-in-cheekness of it because it's pretending to give you advice but it's not entirely useful and it's just a play on words all throughout the text and I think what's also done really brilliantly is Minnie Gray's illustrations and I don't think you can shy away from just how brilliant they are every page is just a delight whether you're reading the poem or sort of going through the story and the poetry with her illustrations they're fab um so it's got lots of wordplay, it's got lots of rhyme, it's got lots of different formats throughout it, and it's just silly. And I think for some children, in my own experience, there's a fear of poetry in that we're going to have to analyse it, we're going to have to understand it, we're going to have to have a personal connection to it. And for some children, that's not the easiest in route in to learning about poetry. But something like this collection is just silly there's poems about toast and there's poems about dunking biscuits and there's poems about onions um it's just really brilliant really fun lots of really great poetry throughout the whole book really love it have you chosen one to read to us i have yes so it's called wednesdays the high point of the week and i think as teachers <laughs> we will understand this really well if the week is geography, then Wednesday must be the hill in the middle. You spent days climbing up, hauling yourself forwards. And now you stand surveying the world around you, everything sparkling. And from here, it's all downhill, freewheeling towards the weekend. Which isn't to say, in case a teacher reads this poem, that Thursday and Friday should be careless, carefree work shy days but they are almost the weekend so love it just love it and you're reading that on a very good day because it's a friday as we're recording this and not only is it it's no ordinary friday it's a friday before a holiday so. exactly even better <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you both so much. Hopefully you'll come back again um, at the end. Uh, but I'm going to talk now to Kate Hitching. Hi. Hi, Kate. We're so glad we can hear you and we yes. can see you. I'm so glad, I'm so glad to join. Um, so this is the book that I've brought along today, which is the Tiger Tiger Burning Bright book edited by Fiona Waters. Um, so the reason why I, I chose this initially was because I just read Tiger by S.F. Said, and I was like, oh, it would be lovely to make that link, to have that poem, to have just poem, and that's on the back. Um, but actually, once I'd opened it, there was so much more, um, and I got really excited by the anthology. I've got the previous anthology as well, but um, I, I just really loved lots of the concepts of this one. Um, so, so at the, at the, at the, in the introduction, it talks about um, poems as mini story worlds, 
which I really liked as an idea, bite-sized mini story worlds that can be nibbled on word by word or just swallowed in one big gulp. And I really like that idea. And sometimes I think that's exactly right in the classroom. And maybe that's why we don't use poems as often as we could, because we think of them as those that you always have to analyse and think about carefully. And sometimes it's just fun to have the ones that you can just swallow in the gulp. Um, So I I really like that. And it also was saying about you don't have to, just like Roy was saying, you don't have to necessarily understand everything in a poem. You can just enjoy it, be moved by it, think about it, enjoy the wordplay of it. Um, so, so for all those reasons, I was, I was sort of quite excited to get into the book. Um, I like I like anthologies because I think they make me read poems I don't like, don't don't know, haven't met before, read new poets. I quite like these, and I think these work really well in the classroom when they've got um, like a poem per day. Which at the beginning I sort of thought, well, that might seem a little bit gimmicky but actually it, it I think it's a very easy way in for children because they will pick up a poem often they'll find the poem that's for their birthday um, and so straight away rather than looking for a poem they know they find a new poem um, uh, or and I really like in here there's a really lovely one for Valentine's Day um, but it's often I teach year three four and Valentine's Day if it was a sort of traditional love poem might not go down well in the classroom. But for the Valentine's Day poem in this book, um, it's a porcupine um, and a love poem of a porcupine, which is just, it's just good fun. Um, and it's, I won't read all of it, but it's porcupine, oh porcupine, will you be my Valentine? The touch of your quill sends chills down my spine, um, which is just fun. Um, I love that. Yeah, I, I, I really do. And I think, you know, you, you in, in a classroom where maybe you couldn't get away with most love poems, you could you could get away with that. And there's another um, hippo love poem as well, which is which is really good fun. About um, there's a, my winsome waddlesome mud basking companion, um, and it's just there's lots of the poems with lots of wordplay, lots of fun rhyme, um, lots of unexpected surprises. So the, I tried to list the animals that there are in here. And I gave up because there are too many. But it, they're, they're ones that you'd expect there to be poems about. But there's also poems about um, wood, wood lice and sloths and ladybirds and worms. And every animal you can imagine gets a poem. So, again, it's another way in for children where they could pick, up, pick, pick it up, think, oh, what animal can I find? Um, and then you, re- you think you're reading a poem about a dog. And and so you are reading a poem about a sheepdog, but suddenly you're also reading a poem about the nativity and a sheepdog's view of the nativity. And I just love the fact there's so many surprises in the book. So yeah, that's that's why. Yeah, I love um, what you've said there, Um, and that idea that you know a poem. It when the the minute you put it into a collection or an anthology that is themed, it sort of becomes about that thing. But actually, they're always about much more. They're yeah. about relationships and as, as many things as you can think of. I also picked an anthology one. Um, this one, which you might know, actually, Kate, which ties in nicely with yours. It's not got the lavish production of no. the Nosy Crow, uh, but it's the Natural History Museum book. And it's certainly one that could go for many different ages, all the way up into Key Stage 3. It's uh, compiled by Anna Sampson, who you might know did two collections. She is fierce and she will soar, the sort of feminist Mm. uh, collections. And it's published by Macmillan, who did the survey with CLPE, and are one of the bigger publishers who've had a very long-standing relationship with publishing children's poetry. Mm -hmm. Uh, The sections in here are fossils, mammals, lizards, birds, uh, I think there's one on space and rivers and volcanoes. And there are little notes that tie them into the natural history uh, collections. The one that I wanted to pick out to mention is in the section called Creepy Crawlies, uh, and it's cockroach. And it's because I like to champion some of the things that actually they do scare me a little bit, if I'm honest. And I wish I liked them more than I do. So I like to read poems that kind of make me think about these things again. So Cockroach by Judith Nichols. Scuttlebug, Shadowfoot, Bringer of Night, 
sky without stars, obsidian light, shiny as coal, new, moon, new mind and still bright, smooth as new carbon, dark and untyped. So maybe I've got a little bit more respect for the cockroach <laughs> having read that. Um, as I say, a good choice for upper primary and lower secondary. It has poets as diverse as John Clare, Sylvia Plath, Grace Nichols, Dom, but Dom Conlon, James Carter. Um, we have Loris Edmund from uh, New Zealand, James Berry, Nina Cass Cassian from Romania. The only thing that I did feel was that uh, in terms of uh, writers and poets of colour, that mm. they weren't as represented as they could be. So I do think that that's something for us to uh, be on the lookout for. Uh, also in here, there are poems by Robert McFarlane and Chrissy Gittens, both on the subject of ferns and they're placed side by side and they give you very different perspective. And a good anthology does that, doesn't it? Absolutely. That's yeah. That's the one. One of the things I like about this one as well. You get three poems about giraffes or two poems about cats face facing each other, but totally different and and two completely different perspectives. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the things I love. I'm going to bring Joe back in uh, to join us because um, Kate, I know you also chose the book for younger readers. I did. So I did. I've chosen this one, which is Zim Zam Zoom by James Carter. Um, and one of the reasons I chose this is, as I, as I said, I teach in a year three, four classroom. And sometimes I think children are scared of poetry. And I know it's partly my job to make them not scared of poetry, but they, they sort of think you have to approach it very seriously and very solemnly and make sure you include all your metaphors and your onomatopoeias and everything like that and do all the proper things in them. Um, and and this, this has been a great... Breaker of down, break it down of barriers. I think in my in my classroom. Uh, so we did recently. We've been sort of performing poems in the classroom, and there's lots there's lots in here that are just fun. And as soon as you as soon as you start to read them, they join in. And I think po poems with repeated lines. It's a very simple it's a very simple thing, but they join in and they they recognise the chorus, and then they're listening to the rest because they're joining in. Um, and there's a, a fabulous poem that. Well, it's very, very simple, but it's just it's just called Funny Faces. Um, and it's just, can you do a big, big smile? Can you do a wink? And it's very, very simple. But I had two of, two of my children who really struggle with English, really struggle with writing, quite struggle with reading. They absolutely love performing it to the, to the class, to each other, responding to all the things in a poem. And it, it just, just made a poem a thing of absolute delight to children who maybe didn't know it could be. And all the poems in this book, I think, do that. They just make poetry a thing that's really joyful. Mm. So, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, James Carter there because he's so good at writing and performing for the younger age groups. He's a master of many instruments as well, uh, musical instruments. And I wanted to mention about getting poets into school because I know that when he does poet visit, poetry visits with very young children, uh, that they work really well. And there'll be other poets who can work right across the school. Um, uh, and I think maybe that's a little different to most novelists, uh, that they yeah. can work across the school. Yes, that's true. Yeah, good idea. Jo, what did you have on the younger side? Yeah, right. I was just linking into what you were saying, a couple of things there about um, poem, poet, poets that can sort of span the ages and, and perform poems while going to school and do things. And one of the, I picked a couple of early years ones, mainly because I was thinking about the starting as early as possible. The idea that children come to school already with some rhymes in their their head, you know, that they can already say and do. Um, and I'll come to the second book that I chose for that in a moment. But also um, going back to what you were saying earlier, Nikki, about um, Otter Barry and being a really good publisher of, of poetry for children. Mm -hmm. And I know you showed a, a poetry collection that would sit really well probably at key stage two but I know it would there were some poems in there that'd be good for key stage one and they've got some brilliant anthologies for key stage two um, mm. classrooms but they've also got a really good collection 
for early years. And the one I've chosen is um, Caterpillar Cake. I don't know if you know that one. And again, I was thinking when you said, because Matt Goodfellow, I know, has also done some collections for older uh, yeah. children in Key Stage 2. And I know he's in the classroom quite a lot with his poetry. Um, and so I picked this one, which I thought was kind of, um, again, they're short, they're fun. The, the link being that they're, they're relatable. They're uh, sort of subject areas that all, they'll all be able to think about and know and join in. So there's the seaside, the story time at school, kind of playing in the park, but also playing in the bath. So there's the home, there's the outside, there's the school links. There's every context. There's, oh, the, the one, there's one about carpet time at school as well. Um, and I can just sort of imagine these poems, again, when relating back to the uh, things I was saying earlier about um, the key stage two, uh, the, uh, please, Mrs. Butler, is that children will want to read them again and again. The one I've chosen to to share with you is um, my shell that's in there because I also think they're very simple um, objects, places, things that children be very familiar with that could then spark creativity in them. So this is just about a shell. And it's my shell. There is a shell alone on the beach, over the sand dunes, out of my reach. It calls to me softly, whispers my name, says, come, won't you find me? Always the same. One day I will see it half buried in sand and hold it up proud in the palm of my hand. We'll sing of the sun and the salt and the sea together forever, just my shell and me. Now, this only came out two years ago, so I've never used it in the classroom with children. I'll, I'll confess to that already, but I could already see that simple objects that a teacher could take into the classroom in a nursery or a reception or even key stage one that this could spark off similar kind of poetry responses so i was trying to think of not just about playing with words sharing the poems so that you can read them back learn them say them together collaborate but actually mm. prompt them to want to be creative and write their own thoughts on yeah other objects that they might have as well so that was my choice for one of my early years ones do did do, do you know this one nikki i do and the other ones of matt goodfellows that i would uh, recommend would obviously be bright bursts of color which is one of the older ones that you were yes. talking about and chicken on the roof yeah so definitely yeah. one to uh, to look out for uh, yeah. if you don't already know him yeah so so I, I, I also had another choice one. And again, I went back to classics again. Um, and again, it's about having that rhythm and rhyme that we place in children's heads early on. But I think you said something earlier on, Kate, about the, having to do other things with poem, like you know, onomatopoeia and alliteration and all that. But I kind of, I'll flip that on the other side and say I quite like the idea of actually having poems that do a few jobs as well. <laughs> and then, yes. So I've chosen the nursery collection by Shirley Hughes. And I couldn't not chose choose it really because, I mean, this was the book that I think made my daughter a reader before she went to school. Uh, absolutely fact. And it's one of those books that I think you, as a teacher you can still read as well because each of the collection, they're mini books they used to be, but now it's in a collection, cover a concept. So you've got... Um, uh, bath water's hot which is opposites when we went to the park which is numbers if you're nodding because you know it really well exercises obviously um, and their noises all about sounds um, and I think it's the 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 use the the way accessible again it's linking it to why I chose the caterpillar cake they're relatable places children will be the, um, most children will have been in some of these environments and be able to relate to the kinds of things they are. I've chosen um, as part of colours to read to you because like all Shirley Hughes um, poems, which are kind of story poems as well in a way, is the pictures bring the poetry to life as well. So I've chosen uh, a couple of colour pages to choose to, to read to you. But the words themselves conjure up different colors of of each type so red and orange but different shades of so you've got scarlet leaves bright berries rosy apples dark cherries and when the winter's day is done a fiery sky a big red sun tangerines and apricots orange flowers in orange pots orange glow on an orange mat marmalade toast and a marmalade cat 
And when I was reading that again today, it, rem- I, it made me think about the fact that, you know, actually it can inspire art, can't it? The words that you read through poetry mm. and the different shades mm. of red in that, that, those few words, the different shades of orange allows children to think about the richness of colour just in a, in a few words. So although it's for preschool and early mm. years, I think you could do something with that with older children as well. Yeah. I'm just quickly going to mention, I won't read from it because we're uh, running. Oh, maybe I will actually. Like I've just changed my mind because I've, I've got a bookmark in there. So I think maybe I, I wanted to really read something from that. Um, it's Coral Rumble's collection. Oh, this yeah. is a Troika mm-hmm. poetry. So Zero Wheel, we heard um, about yeah. earlier, is published by Troika. And so is this book. Uh, Coral Rumble is one to look out for. And this, I would say, is sort of Key Stage 1. It's a really yeah. good collection for Key Stage 1. And what I love about it, um, apart from the individual poems, which are great, is the thought that has gone into a, a kind of, even though you don't read a poetry collection from cover to cover, some thought has gone into the flow all the way through this book. And yeah. one thing does kind of spark and connect to the next. But this one is called Big Boys Don't Cry. Big boys do cry when nobody's looking or the teacher's back is turned in the corner of the park when they get home under the duvet cover. Big boys do cry because words that sting can be flung so hard that they can target a big boy's heart and stab out the tears. So that's in um, this book by Coral Rumble. There's some light-hearted ones in there yeah, as well. Yeah. I do tend to go for the, you probably <laughs> gathered, uh, Kate, I do go for the sort of dark, hard-hitting uh, <laughs> poetry there. That's a wonderful and, collection, that there mm-hmm. really I is. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to bring everybody back in. Uh, While you were talking, I was fiddling around trying to alter the scene because I know that Roy and Sam have had to leave. So they are just big red R's and S's there. (laughs) Um, But this has been a fantastic and and, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, well-read panellist panel. Um, Is there anything else that we really should say about reading poetry i think we've covered a lot of ideas in the last um 50 minutes or so is there anything that you feel that we've forgotten that we should pass on i don't think it's been forgotten i think we've all sort of alluded to it that it it, it can be just read for enjoyment it can be used on a daily feed, like regular basis but I think it's also important for schools and any setting to really look at their collection. So pull out, please, Mrs. Butler, make sure you have some of those really great classics, but actually invest in some new ones with some yeah. new voices. And then your teacher's knowledge and your student's knowledge increases exponentially. But it's having a look at what's new and keeping that being ever, like constantly refreshed. Mm-hmm. What a fabulous thought for us to end on. My very last uh, parting comment is from Joseph Coelho, actually, who um, last year, Erin, you may remember, I chaired a poetry collection at the Federation Conference. And Joseph talked about how poetry is a mood changer. And I love that idea that, you know, if your class is feeling sad, you can choose a poem and you can almost instantly lift their spirits. If your class is in a hyperactive mood, uh, you can choose a poem that will almost instantly calm them down. Uh, And I love that idea because it's true. So um, Joseph has obviously published many poetry books, but three that I was going to mention in the series Out Loud. So Poems Out Loud, Smile Out Loud, and courage out loud. I think there's about 25 poems in each. So with that, I'm just going to put um, uh, the slide up on the screen that shows that book, but I'm not going to read for it. I'm just going to say thank you to all of you for joining me. 
Um, it's been an absolute delight talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting Thank us. You. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>